thank you very much, Gavin, and thank you for uh, inviting me to come along and talk on a subject that's been around quite a, a long while. And, and uh, sadly, in some respects, the, the, the amount of uh, research going into the effect of statins is, has, has dropped off somewhat. And this has left us really with, with uh, continuing a uh, black hole of knowledge when it comes to how uh, statins might impact on, on uh, neuroinflammation. So what I will do is I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some, some historical background, a little bit about some of, uh, of my research that, that led me into uh, looking at the potential of statins in, in neuroinflammation, and, and then how we're moving this forward, because there is still uh, interest in trying to apply these drugs to, uh, in, in the treatment of, of MS. Well, well first, of, first of all, of course, statins uh, arose about sort of 40 odd years ago. Uh, and in particular, they were, they were, there was great interest in using statins, of course, for, for um, cardiovascular disease, for treating uh, hypercholesterolemia, because statins inhibit HMG CoA reductase, which is a rate limiting step of the cholesterol synthesis pathway. And of course, you can reduce cholesterol uh, by, by this uh, inhibitor. And it, they've been widely used, and they've been very successful, and I think it's pretty irrefutable that the, these drugs are very successful in the treatment of uh, a cardiovascular disease. Of course, they are associated with some side effects. That's uh, understandable because uh, uh, of you know, quite the potency of, of the pathway in which they're inhibiting. But nevertheless, it's probably not quite as bad as uh, some of the sort of less intellectually challenging newspapers would say. Now, this has really led to an awful lot of confusion in the field. You know, either, either they're, they're the next best thing since sliced bread or their second uh, worst thing since the devil. Nevertheless, what is absolutely irrefutable is that statins are extremely safe. They've been around for a long, long, long time now. And it's it's quite staggering that it's estimated that up to 32 million people just in the US, that's 10% of the population, are on statins. And that equates to about 30% of adults over 40 years of age. And indeed, worldwide, it's been predicted or, or suggested that up to 200 million people are on statins. So I, I think we can, we can accept that there are some risks of side effects, but I think we really need to put to bed that these are, are dangerous drugs. They are, they are simply not dangerous drugs. So what, what, what was the reason why we first started using statins? Of course, it was for the reduction of uh, LDL uh, uh, a long time ago. But actually, around 25 years ago, there was a bit of a, a, a change in the way that we viewed statins, because at that time, it became clear that they also had sort of immunomodulatory and anti-inflammatory effects. And this sort of occurred at the same time, more or less, as people were beginning to understand that atherosclerosis had, a, had, a, had an important inflammatory uh, component. And, and this led to the sort of concept that statins are highly pleiotropic in the way that they can affect uh, various uh, pathways and effector mechanisms. And of course, that's now the stance that people take. They understand that statins uh, are very pleiotropic. But what exactly does this mean? Well, as I've said, uh, statins inhibit HMG CoA reductase, they lead to reduction in cholesterol. But of course, they will also lead to the reduction in a lot of these intermediate metabolites. And there are a couple here that are extremely important that is, the isoprenoids. Farnesyl pyrophosphate is an important uh, intermediate metabolite. Geronyl, geronyl as well. Isoprenoid is very important. And these are important because they go on uh, to play an important part in post transital modification of a lot of very key signaling molecules, in particular the small GTPases. So what this means is that these, these small lipids are important in, in being linked as small side chains to a lot of GTPases. And these small lipids enable the GTPases to locate in the membrane compartment where they're able to be effective and, and, and do their job. So of course, if you inhibit HMG CoA reductase, not only do you inhibit cholesterol, but you also inhibit these very important isopre uh, isoprenoids, or at least the synthesis of these. And it is this that is predominantly believed to be the reason why these uh, drugs 
are, are, are highly uh, pleiotropic in their action. And over many years, a lot of people have studied this. And of course, uh, one of the first things that came to note was that they could modify the immune system. Uh, and just as an example here, you can see that it decreases uh, co-stimulatory uh, uh, events, interferes with the, the uh, uh, synaptic immunological synapse. Uh, it interferes with uh, processing and antigen presentation. And indeed, some of the early work demonstrated, at least in mouse, that it would cause a shift in, in a Th1 to a Th2-like profile in, in T cells. It also is anti-inflammatory when it comes to the vasculature. You get down-regulation of things such as the adhesion molecules are the key for uh, recruiting passing leukocytes. It reduces uh, chemokine and, and MMP secretion, all of which impact on the immune response. But it wasn't only the effect that uh, on, on the immune system, but also people began to think about their effect on the vasculature. And over and above the effect on uh, adhesion molecule expression and so on and so forth, it also became clear that they were antithrombotic and that they also affected a lot of things such as reduction of, uh, of uh, reactive oxygen species production and that this was very good and protective for the vasculature. Not only that, in more recent years, uh, but probably less well studied, has been the proposal that statins also have a neuroprotective role. And you can see where I'm going here, that you know, these, these wonder drugs, of uh, pleiotropic wonder drugs, are doing everything. But nevertheless, although we don't understand a lot of the mechanism or potential mechanism statins in, in, uh, as neuroprotective agents, what is very clear from the, from the few studies that have been done is that they do impact quite significantly on the production of reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species, which of course play an important role in diseases such as MS and, and as you can see here, in other uh, neurological disorders. And because of this pleiotropy, because of the way that statins were perceived, a lot of people have then applied statins to many, many different uh, animal model systems of disease, uh, and indeed have, have, have carried out uh, uh, interesting uh, clinical studies in everything from cardiology, uh, hematology, oncology, neurological problems, uh, kidney problems, uh, and, and autoimmune diseases. But the jury is still out. It is still unclear that outside the cardiovascular domain whether or not statins truly can be effective. And I think that is, is pretty clear up until now. There are many reasons for this. A lot of these studies are underpowered, for example. But, and, and there's a lot of contradiction. A lot of studies will say there is benefit, but then they're counteracted by studies that say there isn't. So clearly, the, the design of the experiments differ. The drug differ. Uh, different statins have different availability. And so it's very difficult to, come to, to draw any really strong conclusions about the efficacy of statins outside cardiovascular disease. So having said that, why statins in MS? Well, what is the evidence that statins might be efficacious? Well, I'll take you back, and this is the only sort of real bit of hard science I'll show, and I'm showing it because this is what drew me into the field uh, 15 or so years ago. I was interested in trying to understand how lymphocytes trafficked into the central nervous system. And, and with colleagues like David Baker here and Gareth Price, we were very interested to try and work out how this, how this happened, particularly from the vascular perspective. Um, we, were, we were of the opinion that the, 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 the vessel actually played a very proactive uh, role in this, rather than just it being down to the, to the leukocyte. And very early on, we were able to show, along with others, that the adhesion molecules ICAM on the endothelial cell and VLFA1 on the leukocyte was instrumental in enabling leukocytes to, to traffic across the blood-brain uh, barrier. We also were able to show, quite interestingly, that you got aggregation of uh, ICAM on the surface on this docking structure of the endothelial cells. And what we were interested in was trying to work out whether or not ICAM was more than just simply a docking structure, but whether it was capable of transmitting signals that enabled the endothelial cell to facilitate the penetration of the leukocyte across this specialized vascular barrier. And one of the things that we noticed very early on is that if we engaged with an antibody, ICAM, the adhesion molecule on the endothelial cell surface, we actually changed the 
the appearance of the actin cytoskeleton in the endothelial cell. Either actin stress fibers, if their endothelial cells were subconfluent, or you've got this uh, uh, cortical actin formation if uh, the, the, the endothelial cells in culture, brain endothelial cells, were, 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 were uh, confluent. And this was very reminiscent for what you got with a, a compound called LPA, uh, lysophosphatidic acid, that was known to activate the small GTPase rho. Now, you might see where I'm coming from now because I've already mentioned the fact that uh, isoprenoids are needed for, for, for rho um, function. So what we were able to show was that, indeed, if you engaged ICAM on the surface of endothelial cells, you did activate this small GTPase rho, this key uh, signaling pro, uh, protein. And there's a very useful uh, way that you can inhibit rho GTPase. Is that's with a, 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 a toxin called C3XO enzyme that ribosylates and inactivates rho, and it prevents rho from, it, from being activated into its GTP active form. So if we treated endothelial cells with this cytotoxin that inactivates rho, just the endothelial cells, not the leukocytes, we were able to get a very interesting concentration-dependent inhibition of lymphocyte migration across a brain endothelial cell monolayer in vitro. If we deleted the intracellular domain of ICAM and did the same thing, we found that deleting the intracellular domain of ICAM and then you engaged ICAM on the surface with antibody, you ceased to be able to activate Rho, indicating that indeed this is capable of signaling and, 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 and transducing a signal, and you were able to inhibit leukocyte migration if you delete the intracellular domain. So this led us to this outside-in signaling capacity that indeed an adhesion molecule on endothelial cells was capable, once, once it was engaged in initiating signaling, that was essential for the facilitation of leukocyte migration across the blood-brain barrier. And since then, us and many others have, have in, in, included other important adhesion molecules on the surface, show that, that they are also involved in transmitting signals, and that a lot of these actually center around this small GTPase rho. So at the time, we wondered whether or not we could target rho and inhibit leukocyte trafficking. And this takes us again back to the fact that these small GTPases require post-translational modification through the attachment of these lipid side chains, these isoprenoids, that enable them to locate into the correct cellular apartment for activation. And as I mentioned before, of course, these isoprenoids are part of the cholesterol synthesis pathway. So what we asked ourselves was, if we inhibit HMG-CoA reductase, yes, we'll reduce cholesterol, but we'll inhibit phanosyl and general general pyrophosphate, and will that prevent post-translational modification and hence activation of these essential GTPases? And, of course, the answer to that was yes, indeed, we were able to do that. So we showed that as you increase the concentration, in this case of lovastatin, treating just the endothelial cell, not the leukocyte, you inhibit migration. If you add the downstream product of HMG-CoA reductase in the presence of its inhibitor, mevalonate, you rescue the effect. You don't rescue the effect if you, produce, if you, if you uh, add squalene, which is downstream of the isoprenoids but upstream of cholesterol, showing that this wasn't a cholesterol-mediated effect. So what about in, in vivo? And this is where, thankfully, uh, uh, David Bacon and, and Gareth Price were able to really help uh, uh, because they introduced me to the, the Biopsy ABH mouse. And in the acute stage of disease, we were able to show that if we treated animals in a dose-related manner, we were able to substantially attenuate disease formation in these animals with, with statin. But of course, that's not very representative of what one would see clinically. What we wanted to be able to find out was whether or not we were able to inhibit relapse after animals had had an acute phase of disease. So we allowed all these uh, 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 cohort of animals to get grade uh, four clinical disease. We allowed them to go into remission. Half of the animals were then put on placebo, half on statin, to see whether or not statins could then prevent uh, a relapse. And this is what I call Dave Baker vision. Um, he Im imaged these up in the animal house. These are the control animals, so they had a uh, an acute grade four, they went into remission, and this is them relapsing. And you can see 
dragging their, their hind limbs. These animals that were put on lovastatin had an acute phase of grade 4, but then in remission were given a statin. And you can see that they're pretty much unaffected. Interestingly, when these animals were taken off statin, they immediately went into, into relapse. So this we found very encouraging, and of course at the time we were very excited and thought we should really be testing this um, in patients. And, and this is, uh, interestingly, the publication that came out. And uh, since then, and, you know, there's been a lot of papers suggesting that the endothelial cell is the target. Of course, it's not the only target of statins. I've already mentioned that there's a lot, uh, an effect on the immune system. And we waited for, for Larry Steinman and Scott Zamville because we knew they were working on the effect of statins on the immune system, and we held back our, da our data so we could go back to back to nature. They got into nature, we didn't. So we had to quickly hurry up and get it published in, in, in FASEB Journal. Um, it's a lesson for us all, I think. But nevertheless, we all got together uh, with some other people who were doing a lot of work at the time in the field, and, and uh, in a number of review articles suggested that these should be trialled in, in, in MS. But what about the evidence for neuroprotection? Because there was a lot, of ev lot less evidence for that. And we all would acknowledge that activation of microglia is important in MS and indeed in many other uh, neurological conditions. And that the production, again, as I've mentioned before, of, or the activation of, of, uh, of um, enzymes that produce reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species is perhaps detrimental in, in, um, in many conditions. And also that they can affect what has now become known as the neurovascular unit. And that is the interaction between the blood-brain barrier and the other cells of the, of the central nervous system, in particular the astroglial, neuronal, and microglial elements. And that these can impact on the function also, indirectly, of the function of the blood-brain barrier. But I would just like to focus on uh, reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, because I'm increasingly of the view that these are important. And one of the things that we've done, for example, is that we've shown that if you activate... Uh, microglial cells in vitro, you can change their phenotype, which is known because resting microglia are very ramified, and if they go towards an M1 phenotype, they become more amoeboid, and they're pro-inflammatory, they they're very disruptive, and they produce a lot of these uh, reactive oxygen species, and sure enough, in vitro, you can do the same, you can activate with pro-inflammatory activators, you uh, change the phenotype to a more active phenotype, and they start expressing more of the molecules of the M1 phenotype. And sure enough, if you activate with a pro-inflammatory mix, you increase the, in, uh, you, you activate INOS and increase, increase the production of, of nitric oxide. If, on the other hand, you treat with statins, and this is all in vitro, you can change the phenotype from a ramified, uh, from an active to back to a ramified phenotype, and also, you can inhibit the production of nitric oxide. So there is some indication that, indeed, this could be another reason for, for statins uh, having some benefit in neuroinflammation. So we have this interesting sort of three-way triumvirate of, of statin activity. They're immunomodulatory, they're vascular modulatory, and they modulate the redox uh, system. And as a consequence, they can attenuate the inflammatory process, they can protect the vasculature and reduce oxidative damage. So surely, one would think, these must be useful in the treatment of something like, like MS. But if you look at the literature, it is very confusing. Some, both in monotherapy and in co-therapy with things like uh, interferon, there is evidence that they're either have no effect, have an effect, or in, in one particular paper where they did it as a co-therapy with interferon, they had a worse effect than they su suggested that uh, statins might actually interfere with the signaling of interferon. So the jury, again, is still out. I think part of the problem with a lot of these studies is that they really are underpowered, and people have sort of lost heart and lost interest, and we haven't really studied this. And it's interesting to look at the... Uh, the correlate between what happened with cardiovascular disease. It wasn't until there was some major meta-studies that really it became very clear that statins did have benefit in cardiovascular disease. And I think we're some way off yet really truly knowing 
whether or not statins are going to be beneficial, uh, in this case in secondary, uh, in, in relapsing remitting MS. Well, at that point of time, I got approached uh, 10 years or so ago by uh, Jeremy Chatterway and Richard Nicholas, and they said, we want to do a, a study of statins in MS. And I'd been trying to um, uh, encourage some clinical colleagues to, to do this at the time. So I was, I was very excited, and I said, yeah, that, that's great. So they said, yeah, but we're not going to do it in uh, relapsing remitting. We're going to do it in secondary progressive. And I went, Ooh, why? Um, you know, surely we want to do it when it's most mostly inflammatory, and they said, well, no, actually, we want to do it in secondary progressive, A, because there is nothing for secondary progressive, which is fair enough, but we still had to have a rationale for it, and they said, there is also some uh, immune uh, activity going on in secondary progressive MS. And I said, okay, well, that's interesting. Of course, we could also sort of uh, tie in this with a, a potential neuroprotective role for statins. So this was indeed funded by uh, the MS Society, and it led to the MS STAT-1 uh, trial. And this was a, a, a phase two a randomized, uh, placebo-randomized control uh, study in which 140 patients were split into, into two arms of placebo and simvastatin. And this took about four years to, to conclude. And actually, certainly to my surprise, and I, I suspect to the surprise of all of us on the study, we found a significant reduction in the annualized rate of brain atrophy by about 43%. This was the first time, I think, that, that, that any trial had actually demonstrated such a substantial improvement. And that was very exciting. You know, there, there's comments that it might be a type one you know, statistical error. But nevertheless, uh, it was also uh, associated with improved um, uh, disability outcome in the EDSS and, and MSIS uh, measures. So I have to say I was fairly convinced and a number of us were fairly convinced. And as a consequence to this, there is now MSSTAT2 that's been funded partly by the MS Society uh, uh, in the UK and also the MS Society in, in the US um, and, and uh, the NIH. And uh, Jeremy Chatterway is leading this, and they, they've started recruitment into this, uh, for this, uh, this trial. And so I think it's going to be extremely exciting and interesting to see whether or not, in, in a number of years' time, uh, the study that we, we the phase uh, two study, is, um, is, is confirmed. But one thing that was really striking out of the MS STAT1 study, certainly for me, and particularly because I was mostly involved in this, was looking at about 50 different immune parameters in these patients, because all the literature would suggest that we would see some changes in the circulating peripheral blood uh, uh, leukocytes. But when we looked at about 50 different parameters at each of the time point, we hardly saw any difference in those patients on placebo and those patients that were on 80 mg of, uh, of statin. And that was striking, because that, to me, suggested, at least in peripheral immune uh, uh, markers, statins were not having any effect. So what was it that was actually improving the function and the outcome in these secondary progressive MS patients? And that's where we're now getting more and more interested in the, the vascular protective effects of statins. And we have a study that we're just about to start recruiting, which I'll, I'll just go into and, and talk a little bit about now. Because it's my personal view that what is happening is that there is some neuroprotection going on here, and neuroprotection also will link to the vasculature through the neurovascular unit, as well as having direct effects on the microvasculature. And I think what we are seeing is improved microvascular perfusion. So what evidence is there for that? Well, certainly... Uh, a study that was carried, by, uh, carried out by a colleague of mine, um, uh, many of you will know, Xavier Golay, uh, a few years ago showed that using a bolus arrival time spin labeling techniques in, in MRI, you could see that there was, there was reduced perfusion of brain in MS patients. And we put together a proposal, therefore, to look at the effect of statins, hydostatins, on vascular perfusion. Now, some of you will have noticed that I'm based at the Institute of Ophthalmology, so you'll wonder why in hell's name I'm getting up and standing and talking about this. And the reason is that, of course, with the eye, we have a wonderful view on the, on the, on the brain. We have the retina. We can image this non-invasively. 
And so one of the things that we're planning to do is to image not only the brain through MRI to look at uh, fusion, but these patients will then come over to Moorfields and we will do a whole battery of tests of imaging on the retina, particularly focusing on the vasculature. So it's a very short study, and we're just about to start recruiting after numerous headaches in getting it up and underway, uh, not least of which is that we've just uh, um, commissioned and had built uh, a brand new adaptive, adaptive optics SLO, um, which I'll just show you its capabilities in a minute. So I'll just show you the ocular stuff because I think this is fascinating and really can be very, very informative. You're all probably very familiar with um, OCT, which gives us a sort of histological look through the uh, retina. So we can do things, simple things like thickness and, uh, of the different laminated air, uh, regions of the retina. We also have uh, OCT angiography now that's becoming more and more sophisticated and enables us to look at the microvasculature in these living patients in real time without doing fluorescein angiography. But really strikingly, and this is what I love, is that through adaptive optics, scanning laser ophthalmoscopy, we can look at individual capillaries within the patient's retina. And we can look at the movement of cells, both leukocytes and indeed red blood cells, through the vasculature in these, in these patients. And this enables us to look at microvascular flow, autoregulation, and all these sorts of things that may be affected in MS. So we've already done some preliminary studies just to get things up and running. And of course, we've confirmed that indeed in, in, in MS, you actually do start to lose thickness of your retina, that's been reported before. We're starting to look at a number of, uh, of potential readouts, including things like uh, uh, these little inner retinal cysts, these hairpin microvascular loops, which are fairly uncommon in normals, and also ghost vessels and microaneurysms. And these are just a couple of examples of some hairpin loops. This one is actually looping all the way around. Again, as I say, this, you don't see this in, in normal individuals. Uh, to any extent. And um, what we've already found is that actually there's an increase in these abnormalities as we move forward in, with, with, uh, with MS. And these are going to be some of the readouts that we're looking at. And they're quite dynamic um, uh, outcomes. We've also looked at these uh, really, which, which occur, and you'll see them passing down the vessels, these rather large, in a minute there, just whizzed past. This is where you get a uh, a backing up of a lot of red blood cells and they pass down. And we've been able to use these as an in, uh, indication of, 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 of vascular flow. Our current AOSLO doesn't have a frame capture rate sufficient to be able to do, uh, measure an individual red blood cell and track it along a microcapillary, but our new one that's just been commissioned this week will have that capacity. And we've also built in a flicker, which will enable us to look at autoregulation, uh, neurovascular coupling, and see whether statins affect that as well. But nevertheless, clearly there is some effect on these passage of these red blood cells through uh, the microvasculature in, in these uh, uh, MS patients' retinas. We're also going to be looking, uh, as I say, at uh, individual uh, uh, leukocytic inf uh, uh, movement and velocity through these. And I would predict, um, yeah, probably a bit risky saying this, but I would predict that patients on statin will have improved vascular blood flow and improved response to flicker. In other words, their, their, their uh, neurovascular coupling is more functional than those of patients not on statins. And I think that is one of the reasons why we're seeing improved outcome in our um, secondary progressive MS patients. So in conclusion, um, statins have been shown to have anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory effects, certainly in, in vitro and in animal models, less in, uh, convincing evidence in, or data in, in humans. They're certainly vascular protective, and there's increasing evidence that statins are neuroprotective. So together, they should be good candidate drugs for the treatment of, uh, of, of neuroinflammation. And the data from our phase one, uh, phase uh, two uh, trial in secondary regressive MS is certainly very encouraging. And hopefully with the uh, phase three trial that's, that's just about to start, we'll be able to find out in a number of years whether or not this is indeed true. 
So just to finish off, I'd like to thank some of the funders that have funded this work over the years, those that have been working on this part of, of my uh, research activity, um, uh, and of course, people like David Baker who, and, and Gareth Price are here in the, in the audience who played an instrumental role in our early experimental work. And uh, on that note, I'll say thank you and uh, over to the questions. Thank you.